Hello, I'm Elizabeth Wydra, President of the Constitutional Accountability Center, and welcome to today's Purple Chair Chat. We call these conversations Purple Chair Chats because normally we would be coming to you from our iconic purple wing chairs in CAC's Washington, D.C. offices. But we, like so many of you, have been working from home during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and making do. So many of us have lost so very much during these difficult times, and I sincerely hope that you are staying safe and well. Purple Chair Chats, no matter where they come to you from, from our offices or here uh, in our homes, tackle the important legal, political, and constitutional moments of the day. And today, we are talking about an issue that is near and dear to my heart as a longtime DC resident, but also as a constitutional scholar, and that is DC statehood. I am beyond honored to be joined for this conversation by two brilliant DC leaders. First, the truly legendary Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, who has served the people of DC for 15 terms. She came to Congress as a national figure who had been a civil rights and feminist leader, including having been the first woman to chair the Equal Opportunity Commission under President Carter. And she's also a tenured professor of law and still teaches uh, here in DC. So those lucky students. <laughs> the Congresswoman's work for full congressional voting representation and for full democracy for the people of DC continues her lifelong struggle for universal human and civil rights. She is a co-sponsor of HR1, the bill that is currently pending in Congress that would make the District of Columbia the Douglas Commonwealth and 51st state. I'm also thrilled to be joined today by DC Council Member Christina Henderson. Councilwoman Henderson was elected in 2020 as an at-large member of the DC Council, and throughout her career, she has been a trusted political advisor for United States Senators, DC Council Members, and state and local education officials on array of domestic policy issues. Prior to serving as a member of our DC Council, Christina Henderson served as legislative assistant for then minority and now majority leader Chuck Schumer. And so I look forward to getting her expert opinion, getting all the scoop on how this issue will fare in the Senate. Uh, thank you both so much for joining me today. So I want to jump right in with questions because we have a lot to talk about on this important issue. Congresswoman Norton, as many of us might remember from grade school US history, Congress has the power under the Constitution to admit states to the Union, but there are a few more details to be worked out in the context of DC statehood, because um, again, as many of us know from grade school uh, trips to DC, DC also serves as the seat of the federal government, which has an important um, kind of special provision for in the Constitution. Congresswoman, can you explain what the DC statehood bill that you have introduced in the House would do and what our new state would look like? I think you're on mute. What my bill does uh, is to admit the District of Columbia as the 51st state. States are admitted by majority vote of the Senate. We'll have the filibuster to contend with, but we think we can find our way uh, around it. We already have a close to enough co-sponsors to pass. We passed the bill in June. It's gathering steam for a bill of this importance. It certainly takes more than one term. We are having a hearing on March the 11th, that's a second hearing. The reason we're doing another hearing is we find that these hearings educate the public about what they do not know. Many people, particularly when they see me on the floor of the house and I can, I can speak on the floor like any other member, the only thing I can't do on the floor is to cast that final vote. I chair a subcommittee. I can do everything that every other member can do. So I believe I have uh, created the false impression that DC has the same rights as everyone else. That's why 
having these hearings have been so important. For example, last year, after the hearing, we found that, well, let me put it this way, before the hearing, Americans were all over the map on DC statehood. Many said they didn't know, according to the polls. Many said they were against it. Members said, well, don't they already have statehood? That hearing, which resulted in passage in June, apparently cleared up a lot of that confusion because the most recent polls show at 50% of Americans now support DC statehood. We're coming. So I, you know, I honestly, I think that's so true, Congresswoman. I think you're too good at your job. And so a lot of people don't realize just how disempowered uh, residents of DC are, um, you know, so I, I think you're absolutely right that these hearings are incredibly important. And the one coming up um, in just a few weeks, I think will will continue to be very important on that front. Um, so Councilwoman Henderson, I, I think that, you know, again, in sort of the misconceptions about um, DC statehood, a lot of people think that DC you know, can't be that large of a place, especially if you've been here. Um, but the fact is we are a vibrant, substantial community. Uh, we outnumber the residents of Wyoming and Vermont uh, and we pay our taxes and we serve our country in many ways. But unlike the folks in Wyoming and Vermont, we cannot elect members of Congress with full voting power um, or have full control over local affairs. What would statehood mean for your constituents, uh, me and my neighbors? here in DC? Well, I think, um, and first let me say, Elizabeth, thank you so much for the invitation to join you. Um, it's really exciting to be on this panel with Representative Norton, who I've admired for many, many years. Um, but the statehood question, it would mean so much to DC residents to be able to have an equal voice in Congress. Um, I think that the events over the last year, whether it be the protests that happened over the summer and the incidents that occurred on Black Lives Matter Plaza, or even the incidents that occurred on January 6th, where it was our officers, local DC officers, who were called in to help um, you know, deal with the insurrectionists. Um, and protect the Capitol and protect members of Congress who were voting on this very important matter pertaining to our democracy. And yet we didn't have a vote. We have over 700,000 residents who pay taxes, who serve in the military, um, who serve our country in many ways. And yet on some very important matters, um, we don't have a full say. I think the other thing that folks don't realize is that um, without statehood, the, the local work that we do in the district, the, the work that we do on the council um, is not alone. Um, every single bill that the council passes has to go through a congressional review period whereby members of Congress can decide that they want to engage in local affairs of the District of Columbia and decide to block legislation that we pass. Um, we have riders on our local budget that other states and cities do not have that restrict how we can spend funds and how we can serve our residents. So statehood provides in many ways, a little bit of freedom for us to really be able to exercise our voices completely. Yeah, I think, thank you for that. I think that, you know, a lot of folks actually started thinking about um, the lack of DC autonomy with the events of January 6th and seeing how vulnerable that made us because, you know, um, uh, DC is not uh, just the folks who work in the Capitol or live in the White House. DC is the folks who live here. Um, and Congresswoman Norton, I know that you are a, a multi-generation DC <laughs> family. Um, and, you know, DC statehood is obviously about uh, local authority. Um, it's about taxation without representation. Um, it's a democracy issue, but it's also undeniably a civil rights issue. Um, and I think, uh, Congresswoman Norton, you've been very uh, forceful in explaining it that way. DC has long been a majority black city, and we are still a majority black, indigenous, and other people of color uh, city. 
So suppressing the votes of DC represents a refusal to treat people of color as equal citizens deserving of dignity, political self-determination, and that crucial representation. Can you speak to some of this history and how DC statehood is about really meaningful equal citizenship? Yes, and you raise the race question, and of course it is on the table, there's no question about it, but I certainly should clear up any notion that for its history, and we're talking about a history of more than 200 years, that race alone has had, has been the central ingredient in our not having statehood. So to show you just how complicated this issue is, for most of our existence as the District of Columbia, the district has been a majority white city. It was, it became a majority black city during the 1970s. At the moment, it is not a majority black city. It is pretty evenly divided between whites and blacks and it's on its way very soon. And I think you'll see it in the next census to being a majority white city. So that really puts on the table race along other factors. And the other factors need to be educating the public about why their nation's capital doesn't have the same rights they have. Uh, and it's very important to put that ingredient in because if we think it's only about race. What are we going to do when it becomes a majority white city? And by the time we get to the next census, that is what I predict it will be just as it has been for most of our time as a city. So if we look at what really, at, at the other large ingredient, it is that we've for so long been a city paying, by the way, not only federal taxes, but the highest federal taxes per capita in the United States. We have got to change people's understanding of why their nation's capital doesn't look like their states. And that's far more complicated than race. Uh, it requires us to understand that the framers initially didn't quite know what to do about the District of Columbia. But if you look at the legislative and constitutional history, it is clear that they did not mean the people who lived in the nation's capital to have fewer rights than other Americans. And one of the best ways to understand that is to understand how we formed or the framers formed the District of Columbia, formed from two states, Maryland and Virginia. In those states, people had the right to vote for senators and representatives. When the district in 1801 became the nation's capital, uh, the residents of Maryland and Virginia who had given their land to form the nation's capital learned for the first time that they had lost their rights, particularly their rights to full representation in the House and Senate. What did they do? Right away, they went into the streets to demand that the new capital, residents of the new capital like themselves, have the same rights as the residents of the states. This is a long and complicated history, but it's important to understand all of its major ingredients as we try now, and I believe are closer than ever, surely closer than ever to, to achieving DC statehood. So thank you so much for that. And, you know, especially on that last point. Uh, so we had a historic moment in the last Congress with the DC statehood bill being passed in the House. Um, and I know that this Congress with uh, Representative Norton at the helm, uh, things will be smooth sailing, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, that's oversimplifying, of course, uh, in the House. Um, uh, but Council Member Henderson, you have worked in the Senate and so I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on um, how you think things will proceed in the Senate and um, uh, with respect to the Senate in particular, and then I'd love to hear from Congresswoman 
Holmes Norton about uh, the House side as well. What average citizens can do to help speed this process along and make DC a state? Well, <laughs> I think when it comes to the United States Senate, um, particularly this Congress, um, I would say it's complicated um, because to DC statehood, we know will not receive 60 votes of members of the Senate. And therefore, in order to do 50 plus one, which would be the vice president, um, the Senate would need to change the rules as it pertains to the filibuster to make this happen. Um, I know that there are some dissent uh, among some of the uh, members of the Democratic caucus in terms of changing the Senate rules and getting rid of the filibuster um, to do that. But um, at this point, I don't see a different avenue for that to happen. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep pushing forward. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep having that conversation because I do think that as um, Congresswoman Norton said, um, the more we talk about statehood, the more everyone is being educated on what's actually happening here. Um, and I think that's the same for, you know, senators who have expressed, uh, let's say, not doubt, but um, they have not been sure in one camp or the other in terms of what they want to do about D.C. statehood. Um, I believe there was an interview where Senator Manchin said, well, I need to learn more. OK, great. <laughs> I would love to have an opportunity. I'm sure the congresswoman would love to have the opportunity to meet with the senator to educate him on um, you know, what is happening in the District of Columbia and why this is so important um, that over 700,000 people have full representation um, in the Congress. Um, but it is going to be an uphill battle. It's going to be an uphill fight. And I think it's one that uh, residents um, are, are up for. And we hope that we have not just allies, but co-conspirators for residents in other states who have senators and Congress people that they can call on um, to vote yes. Thank you so much. Um, Congresswoman, do you have anything to add for, for the House side and um, how I think that uh, Councilwoman Henderson is exactly right that a lot of this is educational, as you mentioned. And I, I certainly hope that uh, folks in the Senate are, are willing to listen and be educated on that. Well, look, I, I do a lot of my work on the Senate side. I can't just get a bill passed in the House and hang it up. Uh, uh, I have been able to get many bills passed largely by making many, many allies in the Senate. And we certainly have those allies now. In fact, we have 90 percent of the Senate Democrats who are sponsors of the bill. Yes, the filibuster is a problem, but uh, I, I don't see the filibuster as being something we can't ultimately get around. And the reason I say that is because we used to need 60 votes uh, for legislation and it got rid of that. And frankly, um, I'm sorry, they got rid of that for most matters. You still need it for legislation, uh, but you don't need it, for example, for confirmations. They, they have gotten rid of the filibuster for some matters. And if you will note when the Senate organized this year, there was one reason and only one reason that organization of the Senate was held up. And that really had to do with the filibuster. So please bear in mind that the filibuster has to do with a lot more than DC statehood. In fact, when McConnell was in charge of the Senate last term, for example, Nothing went through except Senate confirmations. So there was no legislation. The House had passed more than 400 bills and virtually none of them got through. Some of them were bipartisan. So now we're seeing a real shakeup in the Senate. That's why you saw, you see the Senate evenly divided now. And do bear in mind that we have a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic president who supports statehood. I was just this morning with the vice president, Kamala Harris, for an event here in the District of Columbia. Both Kamala Harris and President Biden support statehood. We're trying to build on that strength 
to move the bill ahead. And we think with their support, you're going to see more and more Americans supporting D.C. statehood. Uh, even as you now see with that vote in June alone, we now have 50 percent of the American people saying they support D.C. statehood. So I, I think, you know, the, the constitutional questions we can talk about, of course, um, but in terms of educating kind of, you know, the average, you know, part of that 50 percent of Americans uh, that is not yet on board, one of the most common things I hear, um, I think, from folks who don't know D.C. that well, especially, is, you know, why don't you just get absorbed into Maryland or Virginia? My answer is we don't want to and we don't have to. But I'm sure that both of you have a much more eloquent and powerful response to that. So please help me out. No, I think you got the right one. No, I'm going to let the congresswoman go. <laughs> well, Christina, I sense you would be the one absorbed. I thought you'd be the first to want to go. But look, let, let me let me say something about absorbing. First of all, uh, Virginia took back its land. Uh, so what we've got is Maryland's land. They gave that land in perpetuity. They'd have to pass a bill, and I don't think it could pass if it's in perpetuity. The second is you even see Republicans beginning to understand statehood is on the way. For example, um, there is a Republican bill uh, to retrocede DC to Maryland. What does that mean? Give it back to Maryland? Why would anybody want to do that? They say because you would get a vote. Yes, you would get a vote. You see, that means they understand we're entitled to a vote. So they want to retrocede it to Maryland. I indicated they gave that bill in perpetuity. And it's important to note that the second in command in the House, Steny Hoyer, is not only a co-sponsor, he wrote a op-ed in the Washington Post supporting D.C. statehood. Now, that's the state from which we were formed. So Republicans are seeing the weakness of having uh, more than 700,000 people who have no representation. So they, when they say, well, let's give it back to Maryland, by the way, without asking Maryland's consent, what they are doing is conceding that it is time for DC to have representation. Uh, in the Congress of the United State, states, and if I may say one reason why I don't, why you don't hear Maryland saying, please give us D.C., I think, is that Maryland is one of those states that has only one large city. That is Baltimore. So suppose D.C. was a part of Maryland. That would virtually blot out Montgomery County and had a large part of the state because you'd have two large cities. So it just doesn't fit. You just got to do it the old fashioned way, make the district the 51st state. Yeah. And, you know, it's so funny. I think that um, there are some people who are tied to this idea that the Senate can only be 100 members. And I think they're, they clearly know that if the District of Columbia is granted statehood and we are granted two senators, it, it changes the balance. Um, and for some of them, they may feel like some of them on the Republican side of the aisle, that they can't possibly compete for the votes of the District of Columbia, which, you know, why not try? Um, but instead of saying, give DC back to Maryland, why aren't we also saying, okay, combine the, the Dakotas? <laughs> uh, we're, I don't. I don't see anyone making a suggestion of freeing up two seats by combining states um, that one could say are are fairly small in population um, and and could perhaps be served um, by you know just two senators. Yeah, thank you. There's definitely a very practical. Um, reason for why some folks are opposed to DC statehood. Uh, so thank you for, for bringing a dose of reality. Um, so we're almost out of time, but I uh, could not let this opportunity go, um, particularly as we are wrapping up Black History Month and moving into Women's History Month, um, to ask the Congresswoman about this particular piece of history that one of my colleagues found in an archive. 
Um, it is uh, Jasmine or Amy, do you have? Yes, it's this amazing photo of uh, legendary civil rights activist, Fannie Lou Hamer, <laughs> Ella Baker, and our very own Eleanor Holmes Norton. Um, do you say a moment about, say a, something about this moment and your reflections on these, uh, you know, mentors of so many in the civil rights movement? Oh my goodness, I appreciate seeing that photo again. That's from the 1964 Democratic Convention. I had gone as a student, a law student, into Mississippi um, in 1963. When I went into Mississippi, the first thing I found was that Fannie Lou Hamer had been riding a bus on interstate uh, travel and had been imprisoned. When I got to uh, Greenwood, uh, Winona, Mississippi, or excuse me, Greenwood, Mississippi, they told me that she had been in prison. Now here I'm a law student and they say, would you go get her out of prison? Because the rest of them were college students. And I was enough of a law student to know that what I should do is to call the sheriff. And I said, look, my name is Eleanor Holmes. <laughs> I, I go to Yale Law School. I have informed everybody, the dean, not only my family, but the dean and everybody up there that I'm about to go all over and get try to get Ms. Hamer out of jail. I understand that at least one SNCC Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, that's what I was a part of, had gone over to get Ms. Hamer out of jail and he had been in prison. So I said, I don't see any reason for me to be put in jail because I'm going to get somebody out of jail. I understand, I'm calling you, you're the police chief. Uh, I understand, all I know about you is that when the White Citizens Councils uh, circles the SNCC office every single uh, day or evening, you are not among them. And so I appreciate that. I'm just asking you to tell them that a, a law student is coming to get Ms. Hamer out of jail and she's gonna post bail, that's all she wants to do. I went over there and I'm here to say <laughs> that unlike Ms. Hamer, I was not put in jail. So you didn't have to be a lawyer to try to figure out <laughs> what should you do to keep from being the third person from SNCC to go to jail. Uh, and it was one of the highlights of my life that I'll never forget. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, snapshot of a key moment in American history. And as a as a fellow Yale law grad, I'm extremely proud. And uh, I think I think that, that is a great moment in Yale law student history as well. <laughs> um, so thank you both so much for joining us today to talk about this crucial issue of DC statehood. And just as a DC resident myself, I thank you both for your service to uh, your constituents, myself and my family among them. So thank you so much for joining us at the Constitutional Accountability Center to Congresswoman Holmes Norton and council member Christina Henderson. And thank you all of you at home for joining us. And I hope that this was uh, an educative conversation about DC statehood. And as the Constitutional Accountability Center has endorsed the bill that Congresswoman Norton has introduced in Congress this term. We hope that you will do everything you can to advocate for it and see that it gets passed. Call your representatives, especially those of you who are lucky enough to have them with full voting rights. Uh, help us get the same. And you can find out more on our website, theusconstitution.org. Thank you all so much. Please be safe and be well.